So one of the most difficult times of a divorce, in my opinion, is when you're still living in the same house with the person you know you're divorcing. I mean, talk about walking on eggshells. Things are so tense. You might be afraid of your spouse. It's awkward. There's so much resentment in the air. And that's what I want to talk about today because some people have to live with their spouse in the same house for a long time before the divorce is final. That might mean for financial reasons, the convenience, maybe someone bought a house and they're not closing for a while or they can't find an apartment, whatever the reason is. Some people have to live together during their divorce and it is not easy. My guest in this episode to talk about this is divorce coach Lisa Lisser. I want to tell you a little bit about Lisa first before I say hello to her, which she's sitting right here. So, um, but Lisa is an attorney turned divorce coach. She's a spiritual coach. She's the founder of LZL Coaching, her wonderful practice. And hi, Lisa. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> so nice to see you. Great to see you too. Always nice having you on the podcast because you give really, really wonderful, practical advice. And I want to ask you, do you agree with me that at the beginning when you're still living with your spouses, that might be the hardest time of all during a divorce? What do you think? Oh, it's incredibly challenging because you are at the height of your anger, your disappointment, your confusion, your grief, your fear, like every single emotion that could be involved in your divorce is right at the surface. So you, and you can't believe that you still have to live with this person, but you do. And you mentioned some of the things that force a couple to remain in the same house. Um, but there are so many fears and unknowns. Um, and these days with high interest rates, the whole thought of like having to sell the house and then buy a new house or maybe two new houses is just so daunting that financially many, if not most couples have to stay in the same house for at least the beginning. And sometimes until the divorce agreement is signed. And a lot of times, neither spouse is willing to leave the house. Yeah. So then you have that, like, well, why don't you just move out? Well, why don't you move out? Yeah. So it's really, really hard. And what I want to talk to the listeners today about are tips for living together during divorce. I want to tell my listeners that Lisa wrote this wonderful article called Seven Texts, The. Lisa wrote this wonderful article called Seven Tips for Living Together During Divorce. And if you want to find it, you can go to divorcedgirlsmiling.com. But we're going to talk it through. So I guess my first question is, if you're living together during divorce, how do you cope? And that was the question you asked at the beginning of the article. So I'm going to read each of the tips and then you tell me because you came up with the tips. So the first tip is define your own space and establish boundaries. So yeah, so this is really important and really difficult. So you're living in a house, you've been sleeping in the same room, so how do you find another space? Um, you may be in a home that doesn't have extra spaces. This is where you have to be creative. And maybe it's a den that you convert. Maybe it's a study. Maybe it's a guest room. Maybe it's the basement. But you have to find another space that you can at least cordon off to make a separate living space for either you or your spouse. And if it's going to be for your spouse and you're the one who's committed to separate living spaces, you need to make it nice. You need to make it habitable. You need to make it feel like a home for someone so that it's not relegating him to the basement or relegating her to the office. You, you need to make it so it will feel reasonable. And 
this is the beginning of setting boundaries because perhaps in this relationship, there weren't really boundaries and each of you were walking all over each other. Um, what you, you need, what you don't always realize is that divorce gives you the opportunity to start creating boundaries for yourself because what boundaries really are, are, are spaces that you won't allow other people to pass because of you. It's not like you don't do this. It's that I won't let this interfere with my space anymore. So okay. setting your own boundary. All right. Now I want to go back to the different spaces in the house. So I think Lisa, you have a great point, like that you need really two things one place for the person to sleep. So if that means turning a couch into a sofa bed, buying a sofa bed and saying, okay, I'm going to sleep in this bed and investing, you know, a few hundred dollars in a sofa bed, that might be a good option. That might be your best option. But also you brought up something I didn't even think of. Be a physical space that that person can go to, to be by themselves. So if they're in the living room on your new sofa bed, that you just bought, that's not really fair either because the, each person has to have their own space to go and think, especially during this hard time, or to just have privacy, to talk on the phone, to watch TV, whatever they need to do. So that's like two separate things. So I really like that you said that. And then I think you said something that I really never have thought of, and you're right, when you're getting divorced, there's definitely been boundaries crossed. And so it's a good opportunity to say, I'm not going to put up with this from him or her, who, whoever you're divorcing, or any new relationships either. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard because we, we sometimes feel like saying to someone, this is my boundary. You can't cross it is setting your boundaries. But very often we say it, they cross it, and we still let them do it because we don't know how not to engage in that practice because it's been our habit. It's been our pattern. So now is the time to break the pattern. And I will say I have been divorced for 18 years, and it's almost too painful to tell you and my the whole country. Um, mm -hmm about the boundary that I never set. And I never really knew how it became so normalized to me that now I have a child who's acting that way and not respecting that boundary also. So if you don't set the boundaries now, it will bleed over and your kids will think that that is normal or could think that that yes. is normal. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the second tip for living together, which is allocating parent responsibilities. So a lot of people are listening and they're thinking to themselves, well, we need a lawyer for this and we have to wait till we go to mediation and the judge is going to tell us you're saying no. Yeah, I'm saying no, because you're, you've decided that you want to be separate and you are in this in-between space of, of not being married and not being divorced. And you're also in the in-between space of not living in the same rooms now. Okay, so the kids are seeing that you are separate. And so now you have to try and get used to the idea that you're going to have separate time with the kids. So how does that work? And how can you do this in a way that is successful? So that's what, why I say here, allocate parental responsibilities. Because ultimately, we want people to be successful here. We don't want to set people up for failure. And what I have seen in many cases when clients are coming to me is that they're feeling like they're falling into traps that their post that their parent their spouse or soon to be ex is setting for them where they're not getting a phone number of a carpool or the carpool has changed and no one told them or they had a plan for bringing the kid lunch from a 
diner and then the parent the other parent said oh you forgot lunch so i made it and so there's all of these tactics that parents use to sabotage the other so my theory and it works is make that plan in advance with the goal of not sabotaging each other so that the children will know that they can rely on you to be your best self. Because that's well, cool. Lisa, that's such a good way of thinking, but we both know how hard it is when you absolutely hate your ex and you can't even look at that person. Now you're supposed to sit back and come up with a parenting schedule and talk, but you bring up a great point because yes, and this is what I want to tell listeners. And Lisa, tell me if you like this idea. If you feel like you can't even look at your ex, you come up with the parenting plan, what you think your will make your spouse happy, will work for you, will be best for the kids. And then just, you could email it. You could just present it to him or her and then say, look, here's what I think we should do in the meantime. That's it. If you already come up with it, then all you have to do is listen to them say, well, this works, but this doesn't. And then, okay, now you have a parenting plan temporarily. And guess what else that does? It helps you when you actually have to go either to litigation or to a mediator. Now what you're already doing is going to be like the standard. And they might say, is this working? Yes. Well, let's do this. Let's put this in the parenting plan. So I guess I hate to say this to my listeners, but you got to suck it up for the kids and for you, your own happiness and allocate these parent responsibilities early on. Yeah, it's really important. Um, it's hard to say you have a parenting schedule and and clear lines of it's dad's on and mom's off and mom's on and dad's off if both of you are in the house right? That seems really artificial. So the, the goal is not to interfere with each other in a way that sabotages or to help each other. Like if dad doesn't know where those shoes are, but you remember taking them off when the kid came in from the snowstorm, help, right? That's also, don't say, well, it's your job to find them, help. <laughs> Right. Even though you, you want to say you dumb idiot, you know, and you want to say these things, but you, you really please hold back and think of your children. Well, this is something I ask, like, how does that serve you? Right. How does it serve you to not help? Does it give you like some inner satisfaction? Like he can't really parent and what does that get you in the long run? Like, does it get you a better deal? Does it get you a better relationship with your kids if now your kid is stressed because they can't find their shoes? I mean, what actually serves you better? Showing your child that you can adapt even in a hard circumstance. Like, which is really going to serve you in the long run? You're listening to the Divorced Girl Smiling Podcast. My name is Jackie Pillisoff, and I'm your host. And today I'm here with divorce coach Lisa Lisser. Lisa is in an Lisa is an attorney turned certified divorce coach and spiritual coach and the founder of LZL Coaching. And Lisa sees clients all over the country. So if you're interested, you can meet with her by Zoom and you can find her at lzlcoaching.com or in the trusted professional section of Divorce Girl Smiling. And today, Lisa and I are talking seven tips for living together during divorce. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we have four more tips. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Divorce Girl Smiling podcast. My name is Jackie Pillisoff and I'm your host, are you having a hard time living together with your soon-to-be ex? 
I get it. I was there. Lisa was there. Lisa is my guest. She's an attorney turned certified divorce coach and spiritual coach and the founder of LZL Coaching. And that's what we're talking about today. Seven tips for living together during divorce. I'm going to move on to tip number three. I said we had three more tips, but we really have four. Okay. Number three, decide together how the household will run during this interim phase. So this is kind of like the co-parenting thing. I mean, even though a judge isn't telling you what to do or a mediator isn't suggesting things and it's not official, if you can make these decisions and present them to your soon-to-be ex, things will be easy. What do you think, Lisa? Well, I wouldn't say things will be easy. I will say things will be easier. Oh, I, that's what I meant to okay. say. I know that's what you meant to say, but the thing is, and and I, I put this in because it's helpful to at least think about it. Because at this interim phase, people can be thinking really hard about finances in terms of what will I get and how will I be able to survive on half? Or they can be thinking, or and they may be thinking, how can I get most and how can I give the other less? So thinking about how the household will run until you have that decision can actually go a long way toward reaching the most equitable result. Because now you're showing up as two people who want to collaborate on the result. And if you ultimately go to court, that will look better for the judge. And if you ultimately go to mediation, you will get through the divorce much, much faster. Which means less money, less yes. resentment, uh, less conflict, a better quality of life for you and your kids. There's so yep. many benefits. So many benefits mm -hmm. because finances are the biggest issue next to the kids that people fight over and they stay undivorced for longer because they're fighting over the money and staying undivorced costs so much money and so much emotional hardship. So now, now I was just going to say that people can ask the opinion of the mediator even before you even meet as to like, can you help me come up with a temporary plan? Because they'll do that for you. Because, you know, if you've never been divorced, you don't really know what to ask for. You don't really know what's fair. What do people get when they go to court? What does the law say? Like, you don't know anything and you're not expected to know anything. So meeting with a divorce coach or a divorce mediator who knows these things and can give you suggestions on how to work this household in the interim phase, I think is very helpful. I think it's really helpful. I think it, it can be one of the most significant things you do. And actually, I also recommend a certified divorce financial advisor because they can look at the whole picture of the family finances, figure out what you can spend now to maintain the households with the eye toward the future on how two households can run on the assets that you have and the income that's coming in. Because even the, the even more than the mediator, the CDFA has an eye toward what is the real money story and how can we divide this up in a way that makes each party whole. So I, I look at all three of us as the, the mediator, the divorce coach, and the CDFA as pivotal to making these decisions. Absolutely. Okay, number four, try to respect each other. Okay, that's almost laughable. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. When I look back on my own divorce, it's like, well, that's the reason we're getting divorced. So how do you respect each other when you have no respect for each other? So so notice that I start this with, with try. try to, okay? <laughs> yes. And I, and I hi, and we highlight respect. Try mm -hmm. to respect each mm -hmm. other. So 
I believe that if you are able to accomplish some of numbers one, two, and three, you will earn the respect of your co-parents and you will be able to respect them a little bit. Because, okay, okay ask the question. Okay, but I was just gonna say, respect has such a broad definition. So I want to tell my listeners, even if you have no respect for your soon-to-be spouse and you are divorcing for that reason, when we say respect, tell me if you, we're on the same page here, Lisa, yes. we mean respect your spouse's time, respect your what your spouse is going through, respect... Um, how they are, try to respect how they are feeling. Not, oh, you don't all of a sudden have to respect their career if you think you have no respect for them. So yes, and like respect your history, right? Like at one time you loved each other. Now everything is different, but you're both hurting. Like you say that in, in one of your earlier articles about the 20 things you wished that you could tell your pre-divorced self, pre-separate or newly separated self. Um, remember, they're hurting too. And that could add to the mean, that could add to the angry is that, that they're hurting too. So remember that. And they might not be as terrible as they are behaving deep down. They may be acting out. So so give them the benefit of the doubt if you can and if they are not harming you in every way. Um, right. It both, doesn't make it 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 doesn't make it right to treat correct. you really horribly, but if you know that it's coming from a place of pain and fear, it's easier to tolerate it. Because you know it's not really personal, I guess, but that sounds like- Right, well, it's person. easier to understand it. I I wouldn't say tolerate it because it still might be unacceptable behavior. Absolutely. If you can understand where it's coming from. You can, you can have whatever opinion you have about the character that you have recently learned or whatever related to your spouse, but- you can respect the fact that their feelings are their feelings, right? That maybe that's where you go. Um, but you are both parents to your children. And that's something you need to own. And then when you are in front of your kids, try to be respectful to your spouse. You know, think about the language that you use. Think about the tone of voice. Now that's not always going to be able or not it's not always going to be possible for you to not yell or to not use a tone. But maybe when you notice that that's where you're going, you pause. You take right. a breath. Right. And also even the facial expressions. Your kids my kids still do it. Every time my ex says something, if we're in the same room, they'll look at me right away to see how I'm going to react. I mean, it's crazy. And they're in their 20s. So you have to yeah. be really careful. It's hard. It really, really is. Yeah. Okay. Number five, be trustworthy, but get everything in writing. Well, if this is all informal, you're saying if you if you draft an agreement on your own, get no, it. I'm, I'm saying something a little bit different. I'm saying that if you agree between the two of you that, you know, you're going to have one one week on and one week off starting on day X, get an email that says that. Oh, don't you don't need a, an agreement, right? This is not formal. Mm -hmm. But if you want to say to the judge that we had a, an informal agreement and he says no we never had an agreement you can say look at this email exchange so that you know and and you you stick to that agreement too because if you're the one that doesn't then you're not being trustworthy so why would you expect your spouse to be trustworthy so so walk the walk if you're going to call out your spouse for not walking the walk. 
That's the lawyer in you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All I mean, right. I, Number yeah. six, minimize contact. Ooh, this is interesting. How do you minimize contact with someone you're living in the same house with? Well, you don't have to say things that are not um, conveying information. So look, you there was a there was a, a three letter phrase that just stuck in my head. It's not a great acronym, but I remembered it. It was CIC, concise, informative, and civil. So if you and your spouse are really having difficulty speaking without big emotions, then every interaction should be concise, informative, and civil. If you're not conveying information that has to be conveyed, you don't need to say it. So just look, if you both are in the kitchen in the morning, you can say good morning because that's concise. The silent treatment may not be good because that's conveying very negative emotions. But you Lisa, can that's so that's so funny that you just said that because when you were saying that, I was thinking that like, well, the silent treatment really uh, is stressful for kids. It's like negative. So you're right. I'm so glad you said that. Like, just say, good morning, everyone. Like, yeah. you know, you don't have to say like, good morning, Tom, or whatever, you know, like, right. You don't have to have a whole, you know, how did you sleep? You could just say, good morning. You don't yeah. even have to say, what are you making for breakfast? You can just say good morning and start your own kid kitchen routine. And then I would say, leave the room ASAP, get your coffee and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to start working early. Yeah. Or like schedule it so that you don't have to be in the kitchen, like on their day. Right. And maybe you could schedule that with your soon to be ex and say, you know, yeah. I usually get up really early. Um, I'm going to go start working and then you can come in and whatever. Right. I that like could be part of the scheduling. Right. In the kitchen. Because right? really you're right about the silent treatment. Kids feel it and it stresses them out, you know, and, you know, we're in school now and these poor kids don't need to be going to school, having this like shitty, awkward morning every morning with their parents when they're trying to have breakfast. It just, you know, and you can do stuff like, okay, let's decide that um you to always take the kids to the bus stop or you take them. Um, Monday and through Wednesday and I'll take them Thursday and Friday or, you know, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Really nice. I mean, Lisa, you, you are such a huge help. I can't believe um, that our time is up. Oh no, but, we have one more. We have one well, more. Well, we have one more, which is how I was going to end this. Every point that Lisa and I have made, well, she was the one who came up with the points, has been something that you will benefit from leaning on somebody professionally. Now, well, that could support the se seventh one was seek support. That could mean friends or family, but also I'm telling you, and I'm not just saying this because Lisa's a divorce coach. I wish so much when I was getting divorced that I had a divorce coach to help me with all of these things. Yeah. It's, it's something that once I learned there was a profession of divorce coaching, I it was like I could have had a V8, you know, like I wish that I knew. And, and I said, that's the role I need to play because I want to be that support for people because it is so very hard. Now and I want, oh, I feel like I keep interrupting you because I get so excited, but Go ahead. What were you going to no, say? You go, you go, because we always overspeak like, and it's, but it's only out of love and <laughs> excitement to get, you know, excited. When I get excited, I can't. Okay. What I was going to tell my listeners is that some people will say, well, like, oh, I'm paying my divorce attorney so much money. I can't afford a divorce coach. And I want to address this because it's very important. First of all, I think for what divorce coaches do, the price is almost a joke. It's so low. But the money that you will save in your divorce, on calling your divorce attorney, on mistakes that you will make, on making not such great decisions, you will get it back 
15 times if you use a divorce coach. What do you think? A hundred percent. I I know that that the work that I do keeps people accountable to themselves. And so they move forward at a faster rate when they are having regular coaching sessions. So that I have one example that is just this week. I had a client that I was seeing bi-weekly, so that's twice a month. And she was figuring out her plan to tell her spouse that she was ready. And she said to me, she was gonna tell him in six weeks, right before she went on a business trip. And I said, why are you waiting? You know what you're gonna do. And does it really make sense to tell him right before you leave? And she said, hmm, you're right. And then she didn't make another appointment. And I just found out that what she decided was she's going to wait until she's done with all her business travel for another three months. Now, she could have moved forward and she's not happy. And there are issues in the marriage that could be dangerous. And yet she couldn't move forward. And because she was afraid and didn't hire me for more time, she took the risk. I also, I thought of something else with this. People will say to me, I'm going to wait till my kids go to college. Now, these are women who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Well, guess what? All that money that you're going to make if you wait four years, that's marital money that you'll have to split. So that's yeah. another thing. But also, or and also, there, there are studies that show that kids who are in their late teens, early 20s, have an even harder time processing divorce than kids who are younger mm -hmm. because they feel like their whole life was a lie. Which if you, if you decided to get divorced when they were five and you said, I'm going to wait till they go to college, then it, it was not authentic. Well, it was authentic, but right? It was a life and there were plenty of happy times, but there was something off and you taught the kids something that it was okay to be in a relationship that wasn't as healthy as it could have been. Right. The right? relationship not gonna... was not authentic. It right. was just, yes, I know. Was, you weren't happy. Right. So in terms of happiness, if you were faking the happiness, then it wasn't authentic authentic, but likely you were experiencing behavior that wasn't healthy and you were taking it. And so I think, we, I think we could do a whole episode on when to leave, why to leave and all yeah. that it should be our next one. Okay. I'm writing it down. Okay. On that note, Lisa, thank you so much for taking time to do this today. I really appreciate it. I love all your tips. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I love speaking with you and sharing this with your big audience. You know, this is what it's about. Women helping women, women helping men, but it's about the struggles in divorce and being a community of support. I love it. And I also want to tell my listeners, I've quoted Lisa like four times in different podcasts. I've been like, you know, divorce coach Lisa Lisser says, I, ha I have, I've done that like <laughs> probably you. three or four times. That's if amazing. you like what you heard and you want to talk to Lisa, the best way to reach her is at lzlcoaching.com. And you can also find Lisa in the trusted professional section of Divorced Girl Smiling, which is divorcedgirlsmiling.com, where you can also find tons of other trusted, vetted divorce professionals in all different areas. And you can listen to more podcasts, read articles, download my mobile app, or sign up for my free consult. So with that said, everybody, thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you real soon.